Welcome everybody back to the channel. We're here for Sure 8, myself and Dane. We're uh, out in the middle of the rain. Uh, it's been raining, it's been a little windy. We've been smelling some gases out here today. Right. And we have some information to share with you guys about the gases coming out of the ground. It's been published just recently. All right, let's talk about some water samples. In the 2018 eruption of Kilauea, there was you know, up to 100,000 tons of SO2 emitted per day, but there is also a ton of other different fallout around the uh, Lower East Rift Zone, Puna, up into volcano area, even around Ka'u, Kona had heavy fog, but we haven't really seen much data on that. Well, we have that data today. That's right, we have some follow-up information on a set of samples taken in 2019 in similar areas as it was taken in 2018, and we have comparisons between how much gas and other contaminants, uh, EPA listed, and other things that are maybe not as harmful to us, but still worth keeping an eye on, that are how, how they've changed from last year to this year. Right. So Dr. Evgenia Ilyaninskaya came out here in 2018. She was from uh, the University of Leeds at the invitation of USGS HVO to do some more thorough analysis on the emissions, uh, the volcanic gas emissions going on. So what she did was sample uh, catchment tanks around Lower Puna and uh, during the 2018 eruption. Mm -hmm. And then she returned uh, one year later to go and sample again and she sampled more tanks around Lower Puna, including some of the same tanks that she sampled the first time, and just provided some uh, cross-analysis, some basically points of comparison. In particular, we saw that the amount of uh, contaminants, particulates coming out of the volcano was really high in that month, those months during eruption, and have really tailed off since then. Right. It's been completely different following the eruption than it was during the eruption. During the eruption, very high amounts of SO2 and many other different gases. And following the eruption, there was still there's still enough to smell, but it's below detectable limits up on the handheld multimeters that H that GateVO uses and right. that uh, the Department of Health would use and anything like that. So what we have today is more thorough analysis taken into a laboratory at the University of Leeds and we've been able to we've been able to look at what is the residual effects of all of this fallout. That's right yeah Dr. Ilyanska yeah, shared her results with us and we're able to kind of break them down in a way that uh, lets you understand how that impacts you guys. Right. All right so let's dive into it. So there are 60 possible contaminants that were analyzed of those, there are 11 that are listed as EPA um, concern, and that was taken at 27 different sites across the island, um, 43 samples in total. Right, so we had, we put out a notice on Hawaii Tracker to get people that were interested in having their sites sampled during this study to get on the list to basically do that, and we immediately filled up that list. Right. She only had brought with her 30 or uh, 40 sam or sample tubes and immediately we had 50 or 60 people responding. So we ended up going around to distribute the sample sites as much as possible to get a better picture of what the what has happened following the eruption, uh, around the eruption site, downwind of the eruption site, upwind of the eruption site, as much as we could to get a full picture. Right, these sites span from Leilani, uh, Alaili area, Volcano, Pahala, Kona, it's across the whole island really that we're looking. Right. And the big picture is, is during the eruption, a lot of the sample sites, including rainwater, was pretty nuclear. It was high levels of uh, sulfates, high levels of cadmium, high levels of selenium. It basically, in everything on the periodic table, high levels of, above recommended levels, contaminated levels. For a few of them were above uh, For the, recommended levels, right? Yeah. Everything was high across the board, yeah. yeah. Right. Everything was high across the board it, comparatively to 2019 now, right. where the across the board, everything has diminished. Right. Um, There's and, nothing that actually exceeds the limits. Right. Nothing is, uh, exceeds EPA limits for contaminants. Right. Everything is at trace levels, but above background levels is right. what we're going to show today. Yeah, exactly. So let's look at some data. 
this data was compiled by Dr. Eileen Inskaya, and it basically looks at all of these different contaminants possible. But if you really look at the data, there's nothing to be concerned about now. That's the real takeaway here. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, across the board, everything has dropped down. A few things that haven't are things that are ocean, uh, influenced by the ocean or other conditions locally to the sample sites, perhaps. Right. And bottom line, there's nothing for anyone to worry about right now as far as what's coming out of the volcano. There is, is an explanation for why we're smelling these things. Right. Um, what they might be, what kind of um, processes might be at play. Right. And that's what we'll get into next is kind of why is it when we're sitting here by Fisher 8, do we still smell things when the wind is just right? Right. Yeah. And we've talked about how the amount of gas is coming out may be lower, but because they're slightly more stinky, the right. H2S variety, rotten egg variety, that we could actually smell it farther away and more intensely. Right. The hydrogen sulfide definitely has that stinky smell. Whereas we were talking about this earlier, when during the eruption, the SO2, you couldn't smell it as much as you felt it. Feel it in the you back could, of your you throat. Back in your throat, in your right. nostrils. You could just feel it in your sinuses. Right. And it was a completely different sensation. But there is some still SO2 we've been able to figure out now with some uh, data that's been provided to us. That's right. So uh, the team went down to the Alaili area. And at one residence in particular, that's been of concern to us for a long time. Right. Um, and to the resident who lives there. Uh, there were amounts detected at, at about 50 parts per billion, right? right? And so that's very, very low. It's below the thresholds of what the USGS uh, handheld uh, device can, can measure. But when we actually bottle that up and take it to a lab and put it through a more advanced, um, right. bigger instrument that's not portable, then we actually can get the kind of results with more higher precision. Also shown on this graph is HCl hydrochloric acid. So you can see here that in Leilani Estates, there is emissions from uh, HCl being detected. Now, the HCl does explain a few things. One, why has it been corrosive to uh, post-eruption to the many metallic surfaces that are still around? Right. And so far, we've talked about how just the presence of steam, the extra heat, and the, and the moisture accelerates the, the rusting. But that hasn't quite seemed to be enough for what people are reporting. Right. And so this maybe gives a little bit of a hint of what else could be at play. Maybe some of the hydrochloric acid gas is accelerating that corrosion even more, right? I remember that's one of the, one of the main components of the ocean entry plume was hydrochloric acid when the lava interacts with seawater. Right. And, you know, in as little as one trip underneath the ocean entry plume, you could have a, a buckle of, of metal and a backpack rust out. I know because that, that happened to me. Right. One interesting thing about this whole, uh, the HCL is where does the chlorine come from? That question. Right. So the easy answer is salt water. But where is the salt water coming from? Well, it's a ways down, basically. So chlorine is most abundant in seawater, um, and the water is deep down, and somehow it's interacting with the heat of, heat of the remnant magma or of the hot ground following the eruption that it's able to kind of convect, move its way up, whether it's through the cracks or in some kind of underground steaming or boiling system that's really unclear, but somehow that salt's able to to mix with that steam, and mm -hmm. that's where you have the, the hydrogen and the chlorine kind of together to actually have that reaction come up as that as that more acidic compound and there's been samples pulled by usgs and others about wells on uh, south of the rift zone south of this intrusion and they've returned a uh, higher salt content than before that's right so this to us kind of correlates uh, okay we have a higher salt content in the groundwater right. and we have hcl being released from the volcanic vents along right. the uh, the eruption site those two have to be related. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's also true that chlorine can come from the magma itself, but, you know, it seems like to see this kind of elevated background across the board, you know, um, is something that is more likely to be related to the groundwater in the area since we've seen an interaction in the steam and all these other effects we've been talking about for months now. Right. I mean, it's, it's worth noting that these levels are actually fairly low across the board. Nothing's harmful. Even this highest spike at the highest property that's putting out all that sulfur dioxide is also, on both cases, below EPA guidelines right. so this is not at a dangerous level and in fact you know we can show later on it compares to some areas of just regular day-to-day -day pollution of right living on an island or anywhere in a, you know even in a, in a city 
And this the reason why we're talking about this is we, we keep saying like, oh, the gas in Leilani Estates around the Lower East Rift Zone is below detectable limits. And then people come around here and be like, yeah, but I smell it. Right. And it doesn't get past the smell test, basically. Right, right. But what we're saying is, is that even though they're below detectable limits, even though they're below um, the standard, the advisories from the EPA, these limits are below or above whatever your threshold for smell is. You can still yeah. smell these things, basically. Yeah. It doesn't mean they don't exist. Don't they still leave. exist. The body can still detect them. Mm-hmm. But they're not in any abundance where we can measure them, and that means they're not in concentration to be a threat to us. Right. So let's give some points of comparison. We know that there's volcanic emissions, but what does that compare to? What about, uh, say, a bonfire or a forest fire or something like that? Something that we people are more accustomed to, to n- be able to compare against. So. Yeah. Professor Elianinske, she went through and gave some comparisons against sites that they sampled along the roads in Kona. You can see that all these contaminants sampled are all at higher limits, higher levels on the right side, which is the actual by the road measurement, than they are at the station measuring air quality upslope right. in Kona. And as we keep moving through, you can see that that's actually a, a, an amount that's higher than we are seeing now in the area in Leilani around the eruption. Right. So basically, if you were to be near a road in Kona, there's more pollutants than there would be sitting here where we are right now behind Fisher 8, not too far from it. We're sitting right here, right in front of Fisher 8, and we're actually breathing some of the cleanest air on the island because there's no cars around us. Right. Okay, so let's compare to something else, something more natural, say a fire. So with the fire, you can see the elevated levels uh, that compared to a roadway are pretty similar. Um, They're not too different, but they're still low. And this is something like a campfire that, you know, kids would sit around and roast marshmallows. It's it's not healthy, but we still uh, experience that commonly. It's the kind of thing that's in our environment all around us that we want to limit our exposure to, but by itself is not something that's really threatening to us. Right. Yeah, so you guys can really see that in some things that are, are higher, you know, um, like the selenium, some things are lower, like the zinc, you know, um, but you actually overall have fairly high metals across the board with copper, lead, iron, those kind of things, aluminum, you know, all extra present around these motorized vehicles. Right. And we can compare that to something else like the sea spray, right? And the sea spray is a, is a big source of chlorine and of sulfate and you can kind of see that um, also carries a lot of other heavy metals, you know, as we may have talked about or encountered in popular culture. Right, and that's really some of the more impressive thing about this is just how much the sea spray if impacts compared to upslope where there wouldn't be sea spray. Yeah. So the bottom line is if you get in your car and drive down to the beach or the ocean and drive back, if that's part of your daily or weekly routine, then being in these areas that are recovering from eruption is not going to be any more harm to you than your regular routine. Exactly. All right, I think we're good.